I'm just, um, I'm just joining to you. Hi. Hi. Great. Great to see you, Andrea. Nice to see you. Thanks How's your day going? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Great. Excellent. Uh, well, we already have several people who've uh, tuned in. So um, thank you so much. This is Andrea Emelife. Andrea is a curator and writer, and she is very hot property. Her name is all over the place at the moment, I think. You just uh, <laughs> curated, uh, <laughs> you curated a show um, last year. Was it last year, Bold Black British? Yeah, that was last year. That was really exciting. Um, it was basically a takeover of Christie's in London and filling it with Black British art, um, which was, yeah, radical and interesting to do. Must be a first, no? Definitely, yeah. yeah. Um, it yeah. was quite fun. Yeah, great. And you have a book that's just come out and another one that's coming out quite soon. Yes, I just had a brief history of protest art that came out on Bob Book Day, so like I think last week. Um, and that was very exciting. So that's a survey of protest art in the last 80 years. I think the earliest it starts, yeah, it starts at Gernica, um and all the way to basically this year, because as you can see, so much of art is reflecting the current times as art always has, but when the years have, been, have meant that there's been so much content, so much debate, so much historical change, that means that the art also reflects that. So there's a lot of very contemporary works in the book as well, and it's so great to research um, and, and write. So I'm working on my next book, um, which is about how, it's like my manifesto for how art can change the world. Um, and I think just quite utopically about the meaning of art and how it can enrich our lives and how it can help us understand humanity and different people and um, answer many existential questions that we might have. And yeah, just using art as an access point to understand the world. Um, so I'm writing that now um, and that's going well. So hopefully that comes out um, next year, which is the time. Fantastic. I mean, that's a topic which is really, really dear to our heart at Athena. I mean, it's really why we set Athena up, because we too believe that art can change the world and that art can help us to understand our history and who we are and our identities and also to think about the future. So I really wanted, I mean, our focus, as I think you know, is, is very much on pre-modern art. Um, and, you know, we define that as pretty much anything up to, say, the, the, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and um, I know from previous conversations with you that you are passionate about art history. So I really wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you how you came to art history and, um, and you know, why, why you continue to be interested in it. Um, so I came to art history in quite an unusual way. Um, my family, my parents aren't really that into art. Um, so I kind of just stumbled across it because I'm passionate about history as a child, specifically Russian history. And so the National Portrait Gallery became like my haven. Like I loved going there. And I found real solace in museums growing up. Um, so then as I sort of grew up, I studied art history at the Courtauld, um, which coming from a very traditional African family is uh, not what they thought I would do. Um, but I managed to fight to do that. And I think it's also this upbringing where I felt a disconnect of me loving art not having my family love it that makes me sort of about making people think that art feel that art is for them because a lot of the conversations I would have with my parents would be like oh art history is not for us you don't really see us or people that look like museums or museums etc and so I guess that must have sort of fizzled into me at some point trying to making it a passion to investigate the different narratives that I feel have been excluded historically in art history and really trying to find ways to look at art and art history and all the academia with it but make it communicate um allow it to be communicated in a way that people find relevance and people find um similarities and things that enrich their contemporary lives so I guess that's why I started writing um I started writing for like publications about art um, and then quickly fell into curating as a different way of storytelling. Um, I still like both. I think that they both are great ways to tell stories of just different modes. Um, but 
basically, I guess, whenever when people ask me what I do, I say I tell stories through art, and I do that in a multiple different ways. And lost you um i'm just wondering whether i can how we can do this again um i've lost andrea i'd have lost the connection but i'm gonna hoping that i can uh, get her again here we are i think she okay let's see she's gonna come up again uh Oh, I don't know what happened. Did we get yeah. cut off? No, we got cut off. We got cut oh. off. Yeah. So I <laughs> wanted yeah. to ask you, I mean, I, I'm really interested in that because um, I used to work at the National Gallery and that was a story that people often said, you know, I was really interested in how you, um, you know, how you bring in groups that haven't traditionally visited the National Gallery and feel as your parents felt um, that it's not for them. I mean, and, and I think there are probably a num number of numerous reasons for that, you know, Maybe they don't see the right. The subject matter is um, is you know relevant to them, or it's not something that they've learned about in their own school lives or in their own home cultures. I don't know whether your parents were um, whether, whether they're born in Britain or whether because you mentioned from an African family or whether they um, whether they were born in in, in Africa. But um, so I just wondered, did you did you find a point of connection? Have you managed to get them to go to the gallery and have they enjoyed it? Have you and have you got other friends that? have had the same kind of experience yeah um oh dear i've lost you again can somebody wave at me and tell me if they can still hear me I don't know what's happening. Okay. <laughs> I, I, the connection. But I did hear your question. Okay, got you again. So can can you can we come back to that question? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I do take my I've taken my mum um to the galleries and to museums, and I find that such an enriching experience because she comes at it at a completely different view. Maybe would it be very interesting? Just keeps figures. cutting she out. Obviously, I, I don't know. It's very it interesting happens. whenever there's a. Sorry, were you saying something? Yeah, no, I can hear you. Go, go, keep, keep going. Oh, great. Um, she's very um interesting. Interesting to go around museums if um not with not with the guest people that are so well versed in the art world or in art history because you can get lots of different takeaways and different narratives that you might not always have. I think that. What I find very passionate when I talk about art to people that aren't well versed in the history and the terminology is about asking how it makes them feel. I think that access point and trying to break it down to some key mm -hmm. themes that I think that humanity really hasn't really changed that much on, like love and death and anxiety and grief and Absolutely. all these things that we can relate on, I think is a great way to engage people and realize that, yes, this might be a renaissance painting in a world that's so unlike ours right now but if you break it down to the cause of what it means you can yeah. really find ways to make it relevant and speak to real life yeah and i think often pre pre-modern art it's easier to do that within in many ways because it's it's narrative based mm. and you know you, you can you kind of get what story the person is trying to tell you whereas i think a lot of 20th century art, you know, modernist art is much more difficult to, you know, to, 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 to come to, you know, to understand what the artist is trying to say. If you haven't read the criticism about it, you know, if you haven't um, sort of, you know, you didn't, you don't know something about the artist's history and what they were trying to do, right? Mm, definitely. Um, and I guess maybe modern art can be, can have the most barriers held upon it. I guess it's also st the stereotype of art that is least accessible um but even with you know the most minimal and um the uh theoretical artwork i think there's um great ways to find relevance and um intrigue 
Mm. I mean, I, I'd like to come back to figurative art and contemporary artists in a minute, because there are some super interesting exhibitions, you know, like the Kahinda Wiley going on in London. And obviously, Kahinda Wiley is all over the States. And Titus Kafar is about to come to London. And, mm. you know, Lynette Yadam Boyer. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of um, really interesting figurative, black figurative artists. And I think, you know, they are super um, aware of art history and have something really interesting to say to us about it. But before I did that, I just wanted to ask you your feelings on how, um, how museums of uh, pre-modern art can increase trust and engagement amongst young and diverse audiences, whether that's um, diverse in terms of um, ethnicity or diverse in terms of class, um, you know, or, 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 or uh, belief. Um, I mean, do, yeah, this is something I think you've been thinking about, isn't it? Yeah, um, I think about that a lot as a curator, because if I, if I speak so utopically about trying to make art accessible, I have to make sure that I'm also doing that in my own work. Um, I think when I think about diversity and inclusivity um, within the museum space, I think it's about breaking down those barriers that makes it feel like those those spaces aren't for them. So whether it's the where the, the where the museums or where the exhibitions are being communicated, what the labels are like, how they're written, um, how the work is contextualized, and how you can create um, spaces which are welcoming. Um, for example, when I did the show at Christie's, the Bold Black British show, I opened it with a big sort of celebration of Black British creativity that invited musicians, poets, uh, fashion designers, different realms of creativity that are created access points to tell the story, to activate the stories on the walls to things that were maybe more relevant or more um, within the language of more people. Um, so it's about sort of finding interesting access points and viewpoints. And I think the museums are doing really well with that. Um, a great example is the Kinder Wiley, for example. I think that that is, um, I mean, very obviously within the language of National Gallery, given that it's um, roofing of court portraiture, but also bringing it into the contemporary. And I know they've been doing some great engagement and learning activities with that. I'm actually doing a lecture for them at the end of going at the beginning of April um, and just doing things like um, that bring real life and real people into the space um, and it's difficult because historically I think there's been some trepidation from museums about um, removing academia and I feel that by activating the space with different realms of creativity and encouraging different people, it's not dumbing things down. It's not shaking things up to a point where the museums aren't learning spaces. It's allowing the conversation to be broader and more comfortable. And sometimes that comes from more informal um, situations, whether it's um, you know going to see a performance in the space or going to hear um, a talk or walkthrough with someone that you isn't an academic and trying to find different ways to tell the story. Yeah, and I think digital, you know, um, online yeah. exhibitions can do a lot with that. I suppose you can also do it with, um, with audio tours and things, but in terms of bringing in different perspectives and inviting different, um, different communities and different, you know, influencers, for example, to comment and to, um, you know, to tell stories about exhibitions, things that, things that interest them. Um, as opposed to the straightforward art historical story. I mean, I, you know, I, I think one of the most interesting things we can do is actually tell narrative stories about who people are. So we did a, we did a project with the National Portrait Gallery recently where we, we, got, we, we, we took a portrait, a, a 19th century portrait of a young boxer, and we got him to tell us his story um, by commissioning a, um, a, young, a young writer to write something um, from his point of view. And I think, you know, it wasn't at all about the art history. It was about who the guy was. But people really liked it because, um, you know, they, they learned something. It's a painting they might, have, they might never have noticed, you know. And I, so I, think, I think there's a lot of more imaginative ways that museums can begin to engage people who wouldn't otherwise um, be interested in, in pure art history, right? Yeah, I think it's great that museums are having these conversations and they're starting to think this way. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that museums uh, have been trying away from these type of conversations. 
uncomfortable because we've been in our homes for two years or we're trying to reconfigure and reconcile what's meaningful, that these um, ideas are really landing and these are real internal investigations that um, hopefully will bring forth some really great things. So I just, we haven't got um, a huge amount of time. So I just really wanted to talk to you a little bit about people like, um, uh, artists like uh, Kehinda Wiley. But, but first of all, about there was a wonderful exhibition. I don't know if you saw it um, in Washington, um, just before lockdown, um, that uh, Adrian Childs curated uh, the Phillips Collection uh, called Rifts and Relations about kind of the history of, um, of uh, African-American artists um, going to Paris and uh, riffing off um, Parisian uh, French uh, impressionists and early modernists. Um, and that was really interesting because you saw how artists like Romare Verdon, sort of early mm. 20th century artists, were really it's interested, brilliant. but doing something completely different with compositions and ideas, you know, that, that meant something to, to them. Mm. That sounds incredible. I haven't seen that, but I definitely have to look it up. That's, yeah, that's, there's a really good I catalog. My I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, and we, we actually did a, I did a podcast with, um, with, with Adrienne, which was great, which has got some of the images. So you can, I, I can you know, make you aware of where that is. Um, mm -hmm. and, but you know, the other thing, the thing that interested me is that there were also um, some artists in the show, like um, Elizabeth Catlett, who, um, who, were, who were not, riffing off European art history traditions, but were looking at traditions that came from African art history. And, and I, I would love to know more about that because, you know, I think Africa has fantastic traditions, you know, so she was, she was thinking about uh, the Ife sculpture, you know, and obviously there's all the, you know, the, the, the Benin bronzes. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's so much that, um, and, and, and I know from talking to Ethiopian artists that there are traditions in Ethiopia and probably many others, which we simply don't know about here. So I, I wondered if, if you had any experience of that. Um, it's great you mentioned Elizabeth Catlett. She's actually in, featured in my book, um, in the protest art book. Um, and it's a great artist I think should have much more recognition. In terms of African artists, I think that we really have just um, hit the tip of the iceberg. Um, Ibrahim El Salahi was in my Bold Black British show, but there's so many great examples of um, African modernism. I think that should be a great major show that comes to London at some point very soon, just expanding and exploring all the different narratives of that, I think would be really rewarding. Um, because it was, again, it's, it's a language and a history that sits, um, it's always sort of categorized as in and of itself, but I think we can be thinking about it as a broader, broader thing, like trying to figure out how um, the world, how certain movements were sitting alongside other ones in different places. Um, and so I put quite a few um, people who I consider African masters in the book, but I'm really enjoying doing that investigation for myself. I very much um, recommend the uh, Biden book um, about African artists. That mm. was great. Mm. Um, and I do think there will be more um, investigations to that because I guess the general narrative when we think about, um, you know, the new artists that are, are, well, not new, but artists that are being um, refound and sort of find, um, getting, having their moment, it's usually exclusively um, African-American artists. But I think now we're looking at Africa, we're looking at the continent, we're looking at um, indigenous and Latinx and all these other mm -hmm. um, categories that really, Absolutely. there's so much art history that we've been not looking at, which is, kind of crazy but it's also exciting because it means it's like a whole a huge legacy that we can dive into and understand yeah. the world better with yeah definitely i mean there's a, we did a, a talk with um babaji de Latunji in um in nigeria and he's mm -hmm. so interesting and you know he's beginning to be known here but there are so many people like him um so i i think i think you're right i think it's a very exciting time for discovering all these uh these artists in in the so-called periphery um, so coming to the contemporary, so um, we talked, to, you, you mentioned Kahinda Wiley. Um, I mean, that's a, it's a wonderful exhibition um, and very interesting what he's doing. Um, you said you're going to give a talk about him. Is there any particular aspect that, you were, that you're going to focus on? 
Uh, I'm still writing the talk, but it's basically just a lecture um, looking at Kinder Wiley and just looking at the presence or lack of presence of the black figure in art history and why um, the hyper visibility of the black figure in his work really um, is powerful and radical. Um, I think he's a great example because he is um, inserting this figure in a way that is completely approachable. Um, and relatable, you know, they wear hoodies, his characters wear hoodies, they wear streetwear, but very much the every man or woman that we can see on the streets and even cast on the streets. I think for that exhibition, he went to, um, I think it was Dalston, the Blue Road Market, to find his um, sitters and his subjects. So, yeah, I guess it, it will focus on figuration and why it's powerful to see yourself within images, within art history, and why it's important. Um, there's so much I can unpack with his work. Yeah. So hopefully they'll let me chat for a long time. Uh, <laughs> and there's lots of questions. Um, but yeah, I think that was yeah. really, really fun. I have to say, I'm, I'm, I smiled when you talked about the hoodies because um, I was wincing in the, um, in the film, watching those poor guys standing there in the snow. Mm. And um, they look, you know, that was, he just focuses, you know, on their face for such a long time. And you can see their teeth beginning to chatter and, and some of them are flying from the cold. <laughs> it really um, is quite brilliant. And yes, and then there's Titus Casper that's coming. I think it goes in, is it, I think it's next week, which I think yeah. is really brilliant. I love his work, especially um, the ones with the, um, the babies that are, are just are missing from the paintings. And I yeah, think he hits on some really... Yeah. Yeah, he hits on some really moving narratives that we, again, yeah. don't really see in art. Yeah. Um, so I think it'd be really brilliant um, to see that work. Having it's really interesting. I'm listening to his TED talk, um, which mm -hmm. I highly recommend to anybody that hasn't oh, called it. I haven't watched it. I'll have to ask. It's amazing. So it's called Can Beauty Open Our Hearts to Difficult Conversations? Oh, that's Basically, very he... timely. That's very what I'm about. That sounds great. Yeah. And, and he, he talks about aesthetic beauty as a kind of Trojan horse. Because what he says is that, um, you know, that, that he, he, he spent years, he said he basically taught himself to paint. And I think Kahinda Wiley probably said the same thing, going to, you know, going to museums and just looking and looking at, um, at paintings <coughs> in, the, in the European tradition. Because I, I suppose, you know, if you want to communicate to a lot of people and you, you were born in America or in Europe, you know, that's the tradition which you kind of have to start with. So, um, because it's, it's what people see all around them if you want to communicate most easily. So he, mm. he said he just loves the technique, but he found that, um, that you know, that, 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 that he, he didn't see himself in any of the images or people from, from you know, p the people that he grew up with. And so, right. you know, he's, he's now trying to amend history to say, you know, I'm quoting him, we were there and we were beautiful. I mean, this is what he says in the TED talk. That's um, amazing. Very, very powerful. And then, that does sound powerful. Yeah, and then all that thing about he talks also about the, 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 the use of tar, you know how he how he uses tar to um to sort of symbolize, I suppose, the violence and the obliteration of the black figure um from from mm. from art history, from European art history. Um but there are also um, I mean there are also some wonderful uh female artists that are doing uh, work in the States and, and obviously in Britain too. Um, you know, I, I, I was mm. talking about Li, Li, uh, Lynette yadon um, and she has, you know, the, the big exhibition, doesn't she? I mean, is she somebody that you've written about? Um, I wrote about the show when it came out. Um, again, that was such an interesting and powerful show for the same reason, I guess. I mean, I guess actually subconsciously that must have inspired um, Bob at British and a lot of the work that I'm, um, about to undertake because I walked in to the Tate Britain for the first time and I only saw black faces and they weren't in the context of oppression or slavery or um, racialization or exotization. They were just black people just living and, um, you know, from various different classes, just really exploring and um, memorializing the black experience in a way that was removed mm -hmm. from so many different stereotypes. I think that was powerful and that was radical in a place, you know, in, yeah. in one of our best institutions to see that. And I'm sure I would have loved to have maybe done a YouGov survey or talk to people going, but exhibitions like that make art 
more relevant and more accessible for so many people because finally people can see themselves on walls and they can understand um it reflects the you know the place where these exhibitions are it represents london which is so mm -hmm. multicultural um that was a wildly successful show even though it was only on for a little bit and i think it's just about to come back so that was yeah, yeah very, very very yeah i heard that's coming back yeah that's brilliant and and people have compared her to Velasquez and, and Dega in terms of her kind of these sort of enigmatic backgrounds, haven't they? Mm. Yeah. She's fair. I love her backgrounds and also just like the way that the the figure kind of sometimes gets lost from them and sometimes there's a lot there's a lot of mystery, um, and they're really beautifully painted. Um, there's a lot that you can see from those from those works. I went to that yeah. show twice very luckily, yeah. even though it was in the middle of lockdown. Um, and can't wait to see them again. Yeah, and there's some great up and coming artists out there as well. So there's like Sahara Long, who is I love Sahara. Too. Yeah, yeah. There's so yeah. many and, great artists coming up now. Yeah, and Michael Armitage, I think, is just completely brilliant. Mm. I really, really love his work. That was another highlight show of last year. Um, yeah, I think I he's always my favorite contemporary artist. I, I just think he's he's fantastic. Mm. He is really brilliant. Again, yeah. looking and very very clearly engaged with our history um, and yeah. which is exciting to see yeah that big that big um i can't remember what it's called but it, i mean you, you just see he, he the, the composition